Well, greetings and shalom. This is Adrian Scott, and I welcome you to Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. Time for another edition of Bible Break, and we are continuing my reading of the book of Genesis, and we will be doing, in this case, Genesis chapter 2. Now, if you have not watched the video that I did for Genesis chapter 1, I really do encourage you. Uh, you can find it pretty easily on the uh, playlist, and I would reference to go back and start with that. I am a firm believer that the Bible should be taken in its entirety from Genesis to Revelation, and we don't drop out chapters or sections that are uncomfortable, even though there are parts that are uncomfortable for me. And frankly, there's more than a few parts that I can't say that I fully understand, but I still think they're God's word and therefore deserve the honor and respect of being read as my wife and I do our reading through the Bible. And like, I, I think we're on our sixth or seventh pass through now. And in this particular case, as I did in the last video, and as I will be doing for all of Genesis, I'm reading from my brand new special Bible I got, the King James Version. Um, I may stumble a little bit as some of that King James English I'm not the most proficient with, but uh, we'll give it our best go. As I do normally like to do, I am going to um, do a reading of the chapter, and then I will go back and touch on a few points. There, there is a reason for that. And I don't begrudge anyone, or I know Ray likes to kind of comment as he goes, and there's not a problem with that. I don't have an issue with that. That is just fine. It is a great teaching tool as well. It's just partly it's me that I make a separation between the word and my take on the word, and it helps me to keep clear in my head. So that's one, one reason why I do that. So I am going to put my eyes on and let's read Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. 
And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So there it is, Genesis chapter 2. And it goes without saying, there's a few things I want to go back and talk about. Um, The first one goes right back to verse 2. And three, um, where he talks about the seventh day and how he rested. Um, I got into a discussion one time with a religious leader in my old church about which day should be the day of worship. Now, really, in terms of just praising God and honoring him and praying to him, and uh, it really should be every day of the week, but there was one day that he set aside and it was to be a day of rest. And many people have taken that rest to include some fellowship with him, i.e. spending time in his word, um, going to services, um, participating in some teachings, watching some teachings, just things like that, that that's what that day is. And that's really Sabbath in our house is what we do. It's a lot of teachings. We read our our portion from the Bible. We just kind of hang out and talk about God. And and other than that, we hang out. We just kind of sit there and get lazy and have it as a day of rest. Um, But it ties into that idea of when. When should that be? And right there, it is, I don't know if it could be any clearer, the seventh day. So some people might argue, well, when is the seventh day? How do we know which is the seventh day? There's a couple of things, a couple of hints that I think we get. The first one is, and I I made this observation to someone one day, again, to the best of my knowledge, I, I recall reading this somewhere, that the Jewish Sabbath, Shabbat, is the oldest continuously observed holy day of any religion on the earth. That's not to say that there's stuff that you know can't be traced to, to be older or anything like that, but oldest, and that's the key word, continuously. So as long as the Jewish people have been keeping the Sabbath, they have, as far as all records go, and the earliest records note the fact that it was something that was already a tradition. So they had already been keeping it for a long time before the earliest records, that it was always that day, the same day that they're doing it now, the seventh day, which on our Gregorian calendar is Saturday, right? That connects to the second point, which is when you look at the Gregorian calendar and the Gregorian calendar itself actually is a follow-up to the old system used to be the Julian calendar. On both of those calendars, the first day of the week is Sunday. If you go look at your calendar right now, we're in the month of August. The first day of each week is Sunday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday is the seventh day. Connected with what the Jewish people have done, I think those are two strong hints that that day is the day set aside by God. Do we absolutely know for certain? No, there will be a time that we will, but I think that's a pretty reasonable guess, all things considered. So that's the day that I do it. But he's like, well, it could be on Tuesday. It could be on Wednesday. It could be, and and again, as I'm talking, if we're just talking about having a relationship with the Father, staying in prayer, keeping yourself in his word, 
to me, that should be every day of the week. But in terms of what day did he set apart? The seventh day, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, right there, Genesis chapter two. Then the next one is a smaller point, but I just always thought it was something intriguing. I will say that early on in my faith walk, as I was really learning the rudiments of the Bible and all the basic things, like I, I really... Prior to becoming a believer, I'd heard of Noah's Ark, but I had no idea what the story was. I I didn't know what any of the events were. You know, I'd heard of Jesus. I'd heard of, um, what's another big one? Um, The giving of the Ten Commandments and that. But I, I had no basis in historical fact or what the Bible actually says about any of those things. I had to learn those. And um, one of the ideas that I'd had was that the, the garden itself was the Garden of Eden, that that Eden was the garden, right? And that they were cast out of the garden, which they were, but it's just a, a small change in the viewpoint when you read, and the Lord God, this is uh, verse eight, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. So Eden is a larger area. And the garden is just a particular part of it that was planted eastward in that area. So then I ask, how big was Eden? Like, what, what amount of land did that take up? And I, I don't know if anyone even has any theories on that. I haven't heard them. I certainly don't know. I just thought it was an intriguing question. But that idea that he planted a garden eastward in Eden, not that the garden itself was Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. There's another little one where they talk about the four rivers, and I won't cover the names again, but uh, it's an interesting one because I know they have uh, wrestled for years, archaeologists and historians and biblical uh, students and stuff, to try to identify some of these things. And there's a lot of issues that come up. One thing is a lot of the names given in the Bible, and this is just one example with the rivers, but it ties into other cities and things like that just don't exist anymore. But to further muddy the waters, as it were, um, a lot of times, even names of places that do still exist that are mentioned in the Bible may not be the original location because the name was just sort of recycled and repurposed for another spot. Um, So it's a real challenge to identify that. The three of the rivers, um, two of them, they have no idea. One, they have some theory but they can't prove it. And the last one, the Euphrates, uh, may not be the actual Euphrates that we know of nowadays. That may have been a case where the name was borrowed and given to another area or moved slightly. Perhaps not. I don't know for sure. But uh, just that idea that that a lot of these places don't exist or the names were, um, in some cases, whether this is one or not, were kind of repurposed for other areas. So a little side note there. Then the last one, and this is going to come in further chapters of Genesis where I'll slow down and I'll talk about this a bit more, but we kind of get this basic introduction to it. So he creates Adam and he gives him a task. Well, technically, I guess two tasks, which we read in verse 15. Um, He took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he was supposed to dress it and keep it, define those terms, what they mean in that context. But those were the two things he was supposed to do. Um, this, t- this does come up in a later chapter, but it's like, what was the primary sin that Adam committed in all of this stuff with Satan and the eating of the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Had Adam done his job, the serpent wouldn't have gotten into the garden, I believe. And so right out of the gate, he dropped the ball. It's kind of funny because he actually is like, God, you gave her to me. She made me eat of the fruit, right? It's like, this is your fault, God. Speaking of that personal accountability I recently have talked about. Um, it's almost silly, but that's what it almost looks like he's saying is, well, you gave her to me. So it's your fault that this happened. No, had you dressed the ground and kept it, the serpent wouldn't have gotten in. Again, I believe. So that's another big point. 
And also a, a small one with that. I'd heard one of the teachers that I do like mention this, and I, I can't say that, yes, this is absolute fact. It was an intriguing idea, and I wonder if there's something to it. I, I try to keep an open mind with a lot of this stuff, especially the stuff that I really don't know for certain. But they postulate the idea, um, and it actually goes back, where was that? It goes back to verse 9 and 10. No, just to verse 9 where it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So it's like, make a period there, right? That he created every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, sorry, and good for food. Then it kind of makes a secondary point, which may separate. And that is that the, also the tree of life was there, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so that he did not plant those himself. I know I don't want to, I'm not getting blasphemous here or anything. This is just an idea or it was done separately or just some idea because it, it, the way it's worded, it does kind of make a distinction that he planted every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But then it says all, like, as well as everything he plant, he caused to grow there was also the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this person just kind of postulated the idea that were those two trees already there? And if they were, did somebody else plant them? And if so, who? All just questions and food for thought. Maybe they all came up at the same time that he was creating the other trees as well. So I can't say for sure on that one, but it was just an intriguing notion. And I, I, I for one... I'm like, I, I like to ask questions and sometimes those questions can get me in trouble. And I can't say that it's like, I, that's what I'm hanging my hat of belief on is every question that I ask. No, I'm just asking questions. One final point, And that is this idea of the name of Adam as it connects to a Hebrew idea. So Adam, which is, uh, that's basically how it would be pronounced more or less in Hebrew. My, my pronunciation is not bang on, on, a lot, on most Hebrew words. But uh, it's kind of funny because you can find, one thing I did mention in previous videos, particularly my Hebrew root stuff, is that in the Hebrew language, you have parent roots. And then you can add things to the beginning of the word and things to the end of it, and it'll change the overall word but the parent root remains the same. And what you'll often find is all of those different words that share a parent root, they'll have some kind of commonality. And this is one of those cases where I think it's a little more um, overt rather than covert. And that is this idea that you have Adam and you can find Adam in the word Adama. And in fact, if you shorten the word Adam and take off the first alif, you have Dam. So what are those three words? Adama is ground, right? So where did Adam, where was Adam brought from? He was taken from the ground and formed. So Adam or Adam was taken from Adama. So you have ground and from ground, Adam is taken. God makes reference in other portions of the Bible on numerous occasions that the life is in the blood. And in fact, there you go, Dom, the word Dom, removing the Aleph from Ada, Adam, and you just get Dom, is the word blood. So Adam is taken from Adama, and the life of Ad Adama is Dom. All of those things are part of the same word, the blood and the man from the ground. Boom, right there. And once again, that's just this fascinating thing about how the Hebrew language works. And I don't think it's coincidental that it works that way. I do believe this is the language that God designed. My personal opinion is that Hebrew is the original language of all languages on the planet. It is not the same Hebrew, I don't think, that we have today, but a variation of it. And there are similar languages to it such as Aramaic and things like that, which are offshoots of it. Um, I think all of those offshoots were, of course, a result of the scattering of everyone at the Tower of Babel when the tongues were confused. Because up to that point, I think they were all speaking the same language, that they would all act as one. And, what, and how did God combat them building this tower and acting all together as one? He confused their tongues. So now they're all speaking different languages and they couldn't work together anymore because they couldn't communicate.
But I think that's where a lot of those languages come from. So you get those first um, derivations from the original Hebrew at that point. And then it just kept getting further and further away from that as time went on. Um, which, by the way, that was what an amazing, amazingly effective way to deal with that situation. How many years later is it now? And we are just starting to overcome that hurdle with, you know, Google Translate and all these, which are still not 100 percent. But it's like we are just now in the modern era in the last number of years able to to kind of overcome that issue a little bit. That's how effective that solution was. Anyways, on that note, I will wrap it up there. Um, if you stuck out to this point, I appreciate it very much. I ask it you can give the uh, video a like if you did enjoy it, share it with others. If you have not subscribed to the channel, this would be the time to do it and click the notification bell while you're doing so, so that you don't miss any notifications for future videos from myself or my brother Ray or the both of us together as we do our planning to do more stuff together. And I will simply bid you all a glorious week. Blessings to all of you in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus, our Savior. And I say shalom and bye for now.